Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study today, and we open the words of Sister White, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, so that as we see the examples of Balaam and the children of Israel, that we may more properly apply this not only to what is going on in the world around us, to the movement, but also in our own lives. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this new day, for the blessings that you are providing, for all that you are doing in our lives, and helping us to come before you today. We thank you for this time that we may spend together in study. We ask, Father, for your guidance. We ask that, our, that your spirit be with us and that your angels attend us. There are many things within this study that apply to us today. Help us that we may more properly look upon these items and may consider them as to how these are to be applied within this day, with this time, with this movement, and within our own lives. We need you. We thank you for this opportunity. We praise you for your blessing and ask now for your wisdom and your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <clears throat> As was being said before we began the meeting, there is quite a bit within the spirit of prophecy regarding Balaam. Now, as I have looked at things in different studies, there are times that when we open the website of Mrs. White's writings, that they will say that there are hundreds of different articles that she had written. And I'm finding that sometimes these are duplicated. What I found interesting when I looked at this was that the earliest articles that she had written go back to 1864, about the time right after the church itself had been founded. Mm -hmm. Now, before you right now is an article from Signs of the Times, November 18th of 1880. <clears throat> I will suggest taking a look at an article from Four Spiritual Gifts. I'm taking a look myself at different articles and putting them all into a paper. Now, as Mrs. White writes, and as we're going to use this to recap what we studied yesterday, the Moabites had not been molested by Israel, yet they had watched with keen and jealous interest all that had transpired in the surrounding countries. They saw that the warlike, warlike Amorites had been conquered and that the powerful and well-armed inhabitants of Bashan had yielded before the mysterious power enshrined in the cloudy pillar. An unseen influence was at work for the Hebrews. And this was accredited to the God of Israel for all well knew that so far as human skill and strength was concerned, it was on the side of the enemies of the Hebrews. It was generally believed that <clears throat> in that country, that prophets and sorcerers had power to curse persons and places so as to frustrate their counsels and enervate their strength, enervate their strength, 
and filled them with fear, terror, and dismay. The Moabites now determined, as did Pharaoh, to enlist the power of sorcery to counteract the work of God, and they would have the Israelites cursed. So, it's interesting overall that the Moabites would choose sorcery. What would we call sorcery today? Well, we have the new age. Well, there's sorcery, there's witchcraft. Is there also not pharmacaea? Well, no, I don't. I don't accept that interpretation. I know everyone takes that that it refers to medications, but it doesn't. Um, pharmacaea, in the context of what, when you look at sorcery. Um, and you look at, because that, that passage there is in Revelation chapter 18, and it's, uh, which, uh, verse 23, right? So in this context, you have Revelation chapter 18, and this is about the woman who has been riding this beast, Right? So this is the fall of Babylon. Correct? Okay. And then it says, um, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So the question is, what is this? If we take that this is medication, then none of this makes any sense in the context of what's being talked about. Because this is a woman riding a beast. This is church and state. This is the papacy. Now, it was noted um, by Daniel Fontenot that if you look at Leviticus 18.23, so these two verses are connected by uh, this same symbol of 18.23, right? So the same verse, number, and chapter. And in this one it says, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie that down there too. It is confusion. So this is exactly what we see in uh, Revelation 17 and 18. We have a woman fornicating with a beast, correct? Okay, agreed. Right. So that's what the sorcery is that is being referred to. It's, it's the use of this papal idea of the combination of church and state. That is, that the church is, is, is um, riding this beast, which is the state. So it's this um, unholy union. So this is what has to be referred to here in this story of Balaam. That's my understanding of it. The fact that people use the term uh, pharmacy, that it comes from the Greek pharmakia, has no reference to, to the biblical idea or concept that's being expressed in Revelation chapter 18. It's not talking about medications. It's not how the world is deceived. It's deceived by church and state. That's the Sunday law. Okay. Because that's the, that's the context. The context here is the papacy. All right. <clears throat> now,
the Moabites determined to enlist the power of sorcery to counteract the work of God so that they would have the Israelites cursed. In this purpose, the people of Moab were joined by the Midianites, to whom they were closely united by the ties of nationality and of religion. As was brought out yesterday, there was, living near the Euphrates, a man named Balaam, who was reported to possess supernatural powers and whose fame had reached to the land of Moab. It was determined to call him to their aid in this emergency. Accordingly, messengers of the elders of Moab and of the elders of Midian were dispatched to Balaam <clears throat> with valuable gifts to secure his divinations and enchantments against Israel. In this movement, Balak, the king of Moab, had taken the lead, having called in the aid of the Midianites with the alarming message, now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. The children of Israel had not gone to war with Moab. The Amorites had been defeated. Others had been defeated, but the Moabites had been left alone. Balaam lived near the Euphrates. Now, we were addressing this a brief bit yesterday, that that was quite a journey to go from the land of Moab to the Euphrates. We were identifying the time frame in which this needed to occur. We understood that this portion of numbers was taking place after the death of Aaron and of Miriam. And it was taking place prior to the time <clears throat> when Moses was going to die. So we have some bookends that give us an idea of when this was was occurring. What is our thought at this point as far as the time to be able to transverse the area from the land of Moab to the Euphrates and back? Would that have been something that would have taken a month? Would it have taken longer? What do you well, think? Well, it can't be more than a month. Now, now the Euphrates, of course, covers a huge territory right. right so i mean the, the point we'd have to figure out exactly which place this is and um uh, because according to uh, this passage when it talks about the river it's it's actually a river that that connects to the euphrates so it's 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 at the point where those two rivers join right so it's at the euphrates or near the euphrates but exactly at which point, that's what I haven't yet determined. Um, so. Okay, the next statement. The ambassadors at once set out on their long journey over the mountains and across the deserts to Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. And having found Balaam, they delivered to him the message of their king. Mm -hmm. So we know that they had to have crossed both mountain and desert. Is there anything symbolic that we can we can determine from this? Would not mountain be like really good times and the desert be the struggling times? 
Okay, that could be one way to look at this. In, in a situation like this, the Moabites were willing to do whatever it took, not only to carry out the word of their king, but also to find a party that could help them in, in what they were seeking to do. Behold, there's a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. Come thou. <clears throat> come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them. And that I may drive them out of the land. For I want that he whom thou blessed is blessed. And he whom thou cursest is cursed. So Balak is saying that he knows that Balaam has this ability. To bless and to curse. He's trying to build this guy up. He's trying to flatter him. Balaam was once a good man and a prophet of God. But he had apostatized and given himself up to covetousness. So that he loved the wages of iniquity. He still professed to be a servant of the Most High. Though pursuing a course to gain the favor of the enemies of the Lord for the sake of the rewards that he received from them. What message is Balaam representing here? I mean, the application that we've been making in our study of judges has been that this is not representing a person or a group, but is representing a message. Is Balaam representing a message here? Well, yes, it's representing a message. Okay. Then what message would we apply it to represent? Well, if you're talking about conduct, not a message, it also refers to conduct such as denying that 718 was valid. We made a mistake. We should apologize to the people that we've offended because we frightened them. That's one way of looking at it. All right. Any other thoughts? When the messengers announced their errand, Balaam well knew that it was his duty to send them back with a positive refusal. Now, when Mrs. White writes something like that, a positive refusal, she's using some very old English that we would not use today. Balaam knew well it was his duty to send them back with a direct answer, a refusal that left no question in their mind. But like many at the present day, he ventured to dally with the tempter, to invite his presence and give room for his temptations. He urged the messengers to tarry with him that night, 
declaring that he could give no decided answer till he had asked counsel of the Lord. It's a fairly damning statement. <clears throat> Balaam was not ignorant of God's work on behalf of Israel. He knew how Jehovah had displayed his power and majesty in bringing his people from the house of bondage. The destruction of Pharaoh and his hosts, the mighty manifestations at Sinai, the countless miracles in the wilderness, and the recent triumphs over Og and Sihon, these thrilling events had spread far and wide, and with them all Balaam was familiar. He could see how terrible a thing it was for finite man to war against the infinite God. He saw the destruction of those who set themselves in defiance of omnipotence. Balaam knew that his curse could not harm Israel. God was on their side so long as they were true to him. No adverse power of earth or hell could prevail against them. But the ambassadors from the Moabites had expressed great confidence in him as one who possessed mysterious power to bring destruction upon armies and nations. And his pride was flattered by their words. I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. The bribe of costly gifts and prospective exaltation excited his covetousness. He greedily accepted the offered treasures, <clears throat> and then, while professing implicit obedience to the divine will, he labored to have his course in agreement with the purposes of Balak. What does this say to us today? Right now, I have no fellowship with the on with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. I put Second John nine through eleven in the chat because it says, "Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed." For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So no fellowship, no hospitality, no rewards taken from the wicked. That should be our standard. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Here is a solemn warning for the people of God today to allow no unchristian trait to live in their hearts. A sin which is fostered becomes habitual and strengthened by repetition. Mm -hmm. It soon exerts a controlling influence, bringing into subjection all the nobler powers. Balaam loved the reward of unrighteousness, the sin of covetousness, which God ranks with idolatry, he did not resist and overcome. Satan obtained entire control of him through this one fault, which deteriorated his character and made him a time server. He called God his master, but he did not serve him. He did not work the works of God.
this warning in 1880, she is giving to the people today. She is giving it to us today. There are men professing godliness today who manifest no more true love for God than did Balaam. It is solemn mockery to profess a faith which does not exert, exert a controlling power over our lives. Christ declared to his followers that if they made it the great object of life to lay up treasures on earth, they could not be his disciples. You cannot serve God and mammon. The man whose affections are centered upon God would not be greedy for earthly treasure. Now, as she would continue. But that cowardly, avaricious spirit, which had been so long fostered, now ruled the man with tyrannical power. He opened wide the door for Satan to take the citadel of the heart when he greedily received the bribe and invited the messengers to remain. The man had become spiritually blind. As it is too often at the present day, the glitter and tinsel of the world had eclipsed the glory of the eternal things. Who else is spiritually blind? Laodicea. So Balaam in this case is representing Laodicea. Because is he, he is, she just said that he's blind. If he is accepting the glitter and tinsel of the world, is he not poor? Mm -hmm. And in the eyes of God, is he not naked as well? Absolutely. In the night season, the angel of God came to Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt with covereth, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, Thou shalt not curse this people, for they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam reluctantly dismissed the messengers. But he did not candidly repeat the words which God had spoken. He did not warn the Moabites that all their efforts against Israel would result in their own destruction. Balaam was displeased that all his bright visions of honor and promotion had suddenly been destroyed. Like a disappointed child, he petulantly exclaimed, Get you unto your own land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. Yeah, and... and from what I can figure out, this is 350 kilometers, so about 200 and some miles they journeyed. Okay, so if it's about 200 miles, so they had at that point about a 400 mile round trip. Yeah. And they wind up making this trip twice. Mm hmm. I'm not sure how long that would take, you know, if you, I mean, backpacking, I can hike in the mountains 35 kilometers a day. So that'd be, 
So probably about a month, maybe. A month one way or a month round trip? Round, month round trip. Okay. Maybe. So we might have in this kind of a situation, two months. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're going to have women and children involved. No, nope. no, these are just Who? messengers. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I mean, they can travel a little bit faster than, uh, you know, I don't know what if they're in a caravan or what, what kind of situation they're traveling in, but probably by horse or donkey. I would have figured by camel. Yeah, that that's actually, yeah, or camel. Yeah, that's possible too. An ass would be best for climbing, though. I can't see a camel climbing a mountain, do they? Sand dunes, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've never ridden a camel. Okay. Now we're going to get into the part of the scripture that is the crux of this study. We're going to see what Mrs. White has to say and then compare this with the scripture so that we may more properly understand and divide the word of truth. When the messengers of Balak returned to Moab after their first visit to Mesopotamia, they reported to their king the prophet's refusal to accompany them, but did not intimate that God had forbidden him. Balak didn't tell them that their offer to him was in vain. And these elders did not tell their king that God had forbidden Balak to come. Supposing that Balaam desired more valuable gifts and greater exaltation, Balak and his counselors determined to make the inducement so great that nothing could hinder his compliance with their request. They now sent princes more in number and more honorable than the first with promises of higher honors and with authority to concede to any terms that Balaam might demand. If you don't like my first offer, you're going to love my second. Here's Balaam. He didn't like the fact that he was told no by God. But he didn't give the message that he was supposed to give. Does this not also remind us of 1888? Yeah, how, did, how, did, how do you make that connection with 1888? Well, when the, when the leadership of the church was given the message by Mrs. White, by Jones, and by Wagner, they did not wish to receive the message. One of the things that I read years ago about this message was that had Christ himself appeared before that conference, that they would surely have crucified Christ anew. I read what uh, M.L. Andreasen said when he was uh, in touch. Well, he was actually with them. He'd go into their circles. All the all the elders that had a, had attended the 1888 conference, and they were very disrespectful toward Jones and Wagner and Ellen White, and they resented her because she was a woman and because she had such a message for them. There was a lot of backbiting going on even then. Okay. Thank you. The king of Moab was deeply in earnest, and his urgent message to the prophet was, let nothing, I pray thee, 
hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. A second time, Balaam was tested and tried. In response to the solicitations of the ambassadors, he professed great conscientiousness and integrity, assuring them that no amount of gold and silver could induce him to act contrary to the will of God. This speech reveals the hypocrisy of the man, for the will of God had already been definitely and positively made known to him. His heart was longing to comply with the king's request, and he was seeking some excuse to gratify his desire for riches and for honor. <clears throat> Why? in 1888 and thereafter was the leadership of the church afraid of the message that Mrs. White and Jones and Wagner presented? Well, it was contrary to the world. But there's also a point very directly that when Mrs. White and Jones and Wagner in concert gave their messages. They found <clears throat> that large sums flowed in in those meetings unbidden. They didn't have to say a word about money. Mm -hmm. Yet the leadership was afraid that they were going to lose control of the money. Mm -hmm. They were afraid that their cash flow was going to be destroyed because of this message. And well, it's yeah, I remember back in the 1990s um, when uh, there was the conflict between, uh, and I've mentioned this before, but Hope International, um, Heartland Institute, and the other place, um, where they they actually put out a book uh called um i think it was called issues and there was also a booklet uh, which was uh, just a smaller version of this that was put in uh, the adventist review and i mean it was all kinds of misinformation about what these ministries were about but really the and, and it was also at this time that uh light bearers had split from these other groups so Light Bearers made its decision to go with the conference, uh, to not accept any tithe money. Um, and, and that's really what the issue was about. It wasn't really about what was being taught. It was the fact that these ministries, in their mind, were, were taking funds that should go to the church. But the reality is what, was the people who, who supported these ministries never gave their money to the church right so it wasn't really money that was being directed from the church uh these the people who supported these ministries had no interest um in in supporting what the church was doing so but th that always has been the issue uh in these types of situations it's about money about control um people's position place mm -hmm. And and that for many people is is a motive to to act in the way that they do. Now, you know there can be jealousies and all these other types of things as well. But but money often becomes a big issue. Money has remained a big issue, especially within this conference. Yeah, and and. And I'm not really sure about the money thing, why people, I mean, I, I think what it is, it gives you a kind of a sense of security in the world. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's the only thing I could imagine why somebody would care about money. But it, it you don't have to be dependent upon God if you have enough money, I think, is the kind of, uh, it wouldn't be thinking, but sort of attitude mm -hmm. that yeah, or rationale that people have. It's like they wouldn't consciously think that, but that's often really what, what is behind it. 
Because to have to depend upon God daily for our daily bread is not something people want to do. Right. The heart of Balaam was with the enemies of God. But hang on, sorry. I hit one button and all of a sudden things just jump. The heart of Balaam was with the enemies of God rather than with Israel. Had he sincerely wished to do the will of God, he would have utterly refused the rewards of Balak and would have dismissed the messengers without delay. Thus, he might have gained a victory over those strong, avaricious propensities, which would prove his ruin unless overcome. The sin of covetousness is fearfully denounced in the word of God. The wicked boasteth in his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Worldliness, covetousness, and avarice are vices which are sure to deteriorate the entire man. They are the fruits of selfishness and sin and grossly dishonor God. Balaam urged the messengers to tarry that he might further inquire of God as though the infinite one were a man to be persuaded. In the night season, the Lord appeared unto Balaam and said, if the men come to call thee, Rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. The Lord gave Balaam his own way, because he was determined to have it. He did not desire to do the will of God, but chose his own course, and then endeavored to secure the sanction of the Lord. <clears throat> This paragraph has had a major impact upon me looking at situations that I have done in my past, in years past. I don't want to be like Balaam. So I look at this symbolically, but also literally and apply it to myself. Here, Balaam urged these messengers to tarry a second time. He is saying, wait, I must ask of the Lord. So when, when he's told, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. He's to wait to see if they're going to do this. The Moabites were a degraded, idolatrous people, yet they manifested sincerity and earnestness in their persistent efforts to secure the power of divination against Israel. According to the light which they had received, their guilt was not so great in the sight of heaven as was that of Balaam. How should we apply this sentence today? I mean, the application of this sentence is just pregnant with pointed warning. Is not the sorry, but it shows us that the heathen, as wicked as these people were, were 
not as culpable as Balaam, who knew better, but he chose to allow his covetousness to overrule his calling from God. Can we also not apply this to both the church and the movement today? Has not the church been given the greatest light in all of human history? Mm -hmm. Yet, has that light been properly applied and shared with the rest of the world? No. So, in this sentence, the Moabites were living up to the light that they had received, but Balaam was not. This is difficult to have to read. As he professed to be God's prophet, all he should say would be supposed to come from the Lord Jehovah. Hence, he was not to be permitted to speak as he chose, but must deliver the message which God should give him. The Lord saw in this pretentious prophet a man whose heart was defiled with deception and hypocrisy and dealt with him according to his own perverse and stubborn ways. May this not be said of us. This instance is placed on record for the benefit of all succeeding generations. This instance is given for our admonition today. It is dangerous to trifle with God in order to follow a stubborn, determined will. There are thousands at the present day who are pursuing a course similar to that of Balaam. They follow their own ways and take counsel of their own hearts under a pretense of being guided and controlled by the Spirit of God. And the prayers of these willfully deceived ones are answered in accordance with the Spirit that prompts them. For wise purposes, the Lord often permits them to have their own way. They walk in a thick mist, the atmosphere which Satan breathes about the soul. Again, may this not be said of us. Dangers beset the path of every man who, forsaking the only true guide, tries by the light of his own wisdom to find a safe way through the dangers and difficulties of the world. Such a man places himself in a situation far more perilous than that of the traveler climbing upon the slip, slippery face of a cliff, where, if he loses his balance for a moment, he will fall and be dashed in pieces. David describes the peril of those who do not walk with God, but for a time seem to be prosperous in an evil way. Thou did set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down to destruction in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terror. The careless, presumptuous, and self-confident press recklessly on in forbidden paths, really thinking that they may depart from strict integrity for the time being for the sake of some worldly advantage. And that after this desire of the depraved heart is gained, they can change their course when they please. Such are walking upon slippery places. It is seldom that they recover their foothold. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but those who choose to invite temptation, who will venture upon forbidden, forbidden ground to secure some selfish advantage will become weak in moral power, and the temptation to evil not being discerned, they will see it only good 
and thus they are left to wander farther and farther from God. We are living in the last days. Evil prevails on every hand. The removal of one safeguard from the conscience, the failure to practice one good resolution, the cherishing of one evil habit, one neglect of the high claims of duty, breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to come in and lead us astray at pleasure. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from sincere hearts, as did David. Hold up my goings in thy path, O God, that my foot steps slip not. Balaam had received permission to go with the messengers from Moab if they came in the morning to call him. Is this clear from the spirit of prophecy? I mean, I look at this as a computer program. I'm presented here with an if-then statement. If one thing happens, then another thing is to occur. If the messengers from Moab came to Balaam in the morning, then he would be allowed to go forward and go with them. Is there any question about what she's written here? Is there any question about its application? She continues, but annoyed at his delay and expecting another refusal, they set out on their homeward journey without further consultation with him. They didn't tell him what they were going to do. They didn't inform Balaam of what they were seeing. He was now freed from their solicitations. And every excuse for complying with the request of Balak had been removed. They're not going to call on you in the morning. Therefore, you're not to go. The conditions have been met. He could not, however, bring himself to relinquish the honors upon which his heart was set. And since the Lord had not a second time forbidden him to go, he determined to set out at once and, if possible, overtake the ambassadors. Accordingly, taking the beast on which he was accustomed to ride, and accompanied by his servants, Balaam began his journey. He feared that even now the divine permission might be withdrawn, and he pressed eagerly forward, hurried, nervous, and impatient, lest he should by some means fail to gain the coveted reward. How little did he in character and appearance resemble the ma a man qualified to execute a divine commission. Now for the moment. Let's go back to this. The scripture here does not give us a complete picture. 
Numbers 22, 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that thou shalt do. The first part of the test was not met. Balaam knew that he wasn't to go, but his heart was so greedy that he wanted to go. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Yeah, so Ellen White adds some detail here that, that's quite important, but would follow based on what happens in verse 22. Right. Now we come to Numbers 22, 22. A doubling, right? Mm -hmm. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Why is it important that we understand that Balaam's two servants were with him? What symbol can we take here? We, we've taken the symbol that the donkey represents Islam, right? Yes. Okay, but how should we look at this symbol of the two servants being with Balaam? Well, it could represent the second angel's message. It could... Um... It could represent something else. In Job 33, 14, it says, for God speaketh, 33, 14, yeah. God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Well, Balaam perceived it. He just didn't want to receive it and obey. Okay. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass and turned her into the way. What, how have we in the past applied this verse with Balaam smoting his female donkey to have her turn back into the way, into the path? Well, it's a restraint of Islam. Right. But where have we applied this, this first restraint of Islam? But 9-11. Are we saying that this was 9-11 or was this the occurrence before 9-11? Well, I always thought that we, we had this as 9-11, but I'm not an expert on this, this story of Balaam. Okay. How we understood it. Because one is I've heard different people present different studies on Balaam. And and I don't think I've ever seen Jeff's presentations regarding this. I've you know, I've heard him mention things, but I wasn't I, I never watched the actual presentations that they first did. And and I've looked for them. I haven't really found them and I'm not sure why. Um you know, I see questions and answers about it. I see, you know, it referenced in lots of different things, but no, 
direct study on Balaam's prophecy and on Balaam. Okay, was Balaam in any manner hurt by the ass at this time? No. This is why I'm asking the question whether this was more representative of the first of where Islam had wanted to attack with the World Trade Center, the failed attack. You're saying 1993? Yes. Yes, yeah, so February 26th. Um, well, to ask Pat, I mean, we could go to Prophecy Helps 101. his I have to look it up here um, Oh, so, okay, well, let's, so you're proposing that the first attack on the World Trade Center is what's being referred to here. I'm asking if it is, yes. It's possible. Uh, well, I, I know that Jeff never did that. Okay. So, so we did have, um, uh, can't think of his last name, Larry something or other, what was his name? Starts with a D. Anyway, from from Australia, and uh, I think from Thailand as well. Uh, that is, he he was a missionary to Thailand. Um, Dotri. Yeah, Dotri. Yeah. So he had this position that we should take February twenty sixth, nineteen ninety three, as as the way mark for where we put nine eleven. But of course, we have all these witnesses for nine eleven, and. Um, so I had a couple of years email exchanges with him um, where he, you know, he, he didn't really make a good case for 1993. But what we do see about 1993 is that it is a prefiguring of 9-11. Um, but I don't know, I don't know if we could put it as this wandering into the field. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe somehow we could. I, I don't know. It's just, it's not what we did. Jeff definitely didn't accept 1993 as any way mark. Okay. But but you're saying it's so it's going to be he wanders in the field. The second time he's going to crush his foot. That's going to be 9/11. And then the third time, that's where the angel stands in front of him and the ass speaks. So that would be the Sunday law. Right? That would be the, the path, yes. Okay. The, 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 whole, the whole purpose of all of our studies has been to examine the foundations. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And did not the Millerites after October 22nd, 1844, <clears throat> come together to examine all of their foundations to address are some of these right or some of these wrong? Did we have the right positions? What should we be doing and saying right now? Yeah. Well, okay. So the interesting thing about this February 26, 1993, we know two days later you have Waco. And Waco is going to be burned to the ground on April 19th, 1993. So, um, I mean, I've looked in the past and tried to understand this February 26th date, what relationship it might have uh, to, to the lines. 
But that was quite a long time ago. I haven't examined it recently at all. Um, so maybe there is some place that it has. Uh, um, because there is some um, symbolic references that we can take from February 26, 1993 and connect to um, the prophecy of Revelation 9. So I have been able to do that. Um, but this I'm, I'm saying this would be different than what Jeff taught if we're going to take it as significant, if we're going to take it as some kind of a way mark from the story of Balaam. Okay. But the angel of the Lord, or excuse me. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. So the angel of the Lord stands between two walls and there are vineyards on either side the walls are there to protect the vineyards correct mm -hmm. so are the walls then protecting the doctrine Well, yeah, I mean, um, that would be one way of looking at it. Um, I mean, the wall we often look at as representing the law. And if you have a, the wall on one side and the wall on the other, this would be the two tables. Right. Right. So if, if you have it as the two tables of the law, which also are represented by the two tables. Um, this would be the angel of the Lord is guiding um, prophecy, and so the so the vineyards themselves might refer to to doctrine at least as it relates to prophecy. So we have we have these two walls. They can be represented by the two tables of the law. They can be represented by the eighteen forty three and the eighteen fifty chart. Right? Yep. The angel of the Lord with the flaming sword withdrawn in his hand is standing between these tables. prophetically is standing there representing the guidance of God and the validity of not only the two tables of the law, but the two tables, the 1843 and the 1850 charts. Okay. So, so just to throw some more information into this this uh, soup. Um, so we had this attack on the World Trade Center. So this is the bombing that was done with uh, um, the rental van that was full of uh, diesel and fertilizer. That if it had been, I believe, like 30 meters uh, over where it was supposed to be parked, it would okay. have broken down the North Tower and it would have fallen into the South Tower, if I remember that correctly. Okay. But it, it just took out a few floors of the parking garage. But if they had placed it correctly, it would have taken down these two towers. Okay. Right. So you wouldn't have had 9-11 uh, later. Now, um, it's 52 days 
so two, so three days later, if you're going to count the 28th um, as you know a biblical sort of count, the third day on the third day, uh, Waco is going to occur. That's going to be the ATF attack on the compound in Waco. Right. And then it's going to be 52 days from the attack on the World Trade Center to the burning of Waco. So you have that that symbol that we had of the 52 plus the 3, or, or minus the 3, to make the 49. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, so, so that's a symbol that we have from the story of Nehemiah. Right, which we've applied other places. So, so it's kind of interesting in that sense. Now, um, now originally when I had looked at this, I had looked at February 26, 1993, as a prefiguring of something, just as September 11th, 1814, is a prefiguring of September 11th. That is, both of these have symbols in them. And that is the Battle of Plattsburgh, September 11th, 1814, that have symbols that that tie us to 9/11, but aren't 9/11. That is, there and and they are way marks within a line. That is, when we zoom into a line, September 11th, 1814 becomes a way mark in Miller's line. That is, Miller's line is a zooming into 1798, right? Right. right when we did Miller's line. And we did, we also have, uh, when we zoom into Jeff's line, uh, we do have 1993 in Jeff's line as well, because that's when he's gonna first publish his study on the lines. Which is in 1993. Now, 1996 is going to be um, the time of the end magazine, but he does his first publication in 1993 so 1996 there's that period of time there between and then we of course we have the Waco event which we have uh, said typifies uh, this movement uh, and I, I hope everyone's familiar with what Jeff has said about that so now there are some some denial of what the story is regarding Waco, whether Adventists were involved in having the ATF um, investigate Waco. So there are some people say that that's just a conspiracy theory. There's no, or just a rumor. There's no evidence that that happened. But that's the idea, at least symbolically, is that Adventists, uh, um, had notified the authority, authorities about this offshoot group um, of Adventism. And, uh, and that's why this ended up occurring, why Waco occurred. But some people say there's no evidence that that actually happened. But at least, even whether it happens or not, even sometimes just the rumors or stories can be symbolic. So, So we looked at this as something that would happen with this movement um, as well, that, that we would be betrayed by the Adventist church in a sense. And, and we used uh, some parallels to that, which were what happened with the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. So back in 2017, uh, there was a rumor going around that uh, what had what was happening to the Jehovah's Witnesses that their churches were be take, being taken and so forth because they weren't complying with the new rules regarding uh, doing evangelistic series and so forth uh, witnessing. Um, but the Ted Wilson put out a statement saying that that that's not happening to Adventists because the church is complying with the uh, the rules that that Russia had had placed upon the churches, which of course would be a compromise of the truth, right? I mean, if the church is going to simply uh, follow the rules of the state that go contrary to our, our mission, uh, that obviously would not be a good thing, but yet it was seen as a good thing. So, so anyway, the point is that we see a parallel between Waco, and Waco is connected with this attack on the World Trade Center. 
Exactly. Yeah. So, so I, th I think it's not something that we can just kind of dismiss. But if we're going to take it as this first event in the story of Balaam, we'd have to have a bit more to place it there. But that is, we could look at it in the context maybe of, of our movement, that it symbolizes something, and then we'd have to figure out where that fits. Right. Well, that's a little bit rambling, sort of bringing all this information together, but um, those are all the things we have to consider. Okay. So, again, the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. So the two tables. The two tables. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. So the ass, recognizing the angel of the Lord, and I'm having I'm I'm having to wonder here if this is not a description of Christ himself. Thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. Now, the point that I heard Elder Jeff make about this multiple times was the crushing of the foot was harming the economy of the United States. So, so, so did he have, because again, I'm not familiar with what, what he said about this. So did he have the first one, 9-11, and this then the economic results after 9-11? I don't remember. This will be something that I'm going to have to look up further. Yeah. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. There's no field. There's no wood. There's no way to turn. You cannot rely on the liberal. You cannot rely on the conservative. You cannot go left. You cannot go right. You're in a narrow place. You're in a strait. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. Now, going back here, God's anger was kindled against Balaam for his heaven daring folly. And an angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. The animal, seeing the divine messenger, who was, however, invisible to the master, turned aside from the highway into a field. <clears throat> With cruel blows, Balaam brought the beast back into the path, but again, in a narrow place, hemmed in by walls, the angel appeared, and the animal, trying to avoid the menacing figure, crushed the rider's foot against the wall. Had Balaam paused to consider, he would have had sufficient cause to question whether he was not moving contrary to God's will. But he was blinded to the heavenly interposition. He knew not that God was obstructing his path. The man became exasperated and beating his animal in a most unmerciful manner, forced it to proceed. Again, in a place where there was no passing, 
the angel appeared as before in an offensive attitude. So the angel appears to be on the offense. He is going to strike. And the poor beast, trembling with terror, made a full stop and fell to the earth under its rider. Balaam lost all self-control, and his mad rage rose to an extreme height. The dumb beast was now gifted with speech and remonstrated with its frenzied master for his cruel treatment. What have I done to thee that thou shouldst beat me these three times? Had Balaam been in possession of his reason, he would have been filled with awe and would have realized that a supernatural power was barring his way. But ungovernable rage had dethroned reason, and this wonderful miracle was unnoticed. He answered this beast as he would have addressed an intelligent being. Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. Here was a professed magician on his way to pronounce a curse upon a whole people with the intent to paralyze their strength, while he had not the power even to slay the humble beast upon which he rode. She does not call him a prophet here. She calls him a magician. She notes that he did not have the power to kill the ass. At this point, does the movement have the power to kill the ass? At this point, does the church have the power to kill the ass? Balaam's ungovernable rage made him blind to the fact that it was God instructing that his path was to be obscured. Yet Balaam, because he had become so greedy, because he had given himself to covetousness, refused to recognize the divine intervention. The eyes of Balaam were now opened and he beheld the angel of God standing with drawn sword, ready to slay him. He was more terrified than the poor beast had been and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. The angel said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thy beast these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. Thy beast saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Here's a lesson to all who have reasoning powers, that harsh treatment, even to the brutes, is offensive to God. Those who profess to love God do not always consider that abuse to animals or suffering brought upon them by neglect is a sin. The fruits of divine grace will be as truly revealed in men by the manner in which they treat their beasts as by their service in the house of God. Those who allow themselves to become impatient or enraged with their animals are not Christians. 
a man who is harsh, severe, and domineering toward the lower animals because he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. And he will, if opportunity offers, manifest the same cruel overbearing spirit toward his wife and his children. God who created man made the animals also. They were to minister to man's comfort and happiness to serve him and to be controlled by him. But this power was not to be used to cause pain by harsh punishment or cruel exaction. Yet some are as reckless and unfeeling toward their faithful animals as though the poor brutes had not flesh and nerve that can quiver with pain. Numbers 22, 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. As the United States been mocked by Islam. In these three events. Well, we take this as the Sunday law. Right. Is it the Sunday law or is it the precursor to the Sunday law? Well, we've taken it as the Sunday law, the, the speaking of the, the ass. So, so I mean, if we're going to look at it as something else, we, um, we're going to have to, I mean, we're going to really have to look at this. Now, you know, I've just done a search. Like, I cannot find Jeff's presentations on, on Balaam. I, I can find, like, references to it, um, but definitely... In 2015, 2016, that's where we would really be needing to look. And I don't find anything yet. I mean, maybe I will. But but I, we do have to look at what Jeff says about this and try to nail that down. Okay. Theodore. Theodore. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just come in late. I'm sort of hobby and catching up. But uh, I got a drive from future from america with all the uh presentations on it me before. too <laughs> all right it was just in case you hadn't got that drive because it was before we were sort of put out and a lot yeah. of the videos were taken down mm. uh, i was going to have a look through that and see if i could find a presentation on the Balaam. yeah and no, i haven't been able to um that would be so myself. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist i could be searching wrong Okay, well, I'll, I'll have a look as well, just, just in case. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we are now toward the close of our study today. We're going to return tomorrow to Numbers 2230 and to what Mrs. White had written, because there's still quite a bit to be covered. Are there any other comments, thoughts, or questions with what we have covered today? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, through this example with Balaam, there are many things that we see 
that we have allowed to occur in our lives. Help us now, Father, that we may not be like Balaam, that we may follow you, that we may be directed by you and guided by you. May that which we do be to your glory and not to our glory. Direct us each now. I thank you, Father, for those that have participated today, for the comments that have been made. Help us now to carefully consider this example and prepare for the study that will continue in this, in this van, in this manner, so that we may more perfectly represent your character and not our own. Mm -hmm. Direct us now to this end. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.